Good evening, uh, everyone. Really delighted that you could uh, join us this evening uh, for the event with Libby Davies, uh, Reflections on a Life in Politics. Uh, my name is Am Joho. I'm director of SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement. And tonight is really meant to be a celebratory occasion because there's so few people in public life and politics that have represented such a grassroots approach to politics so authentically over four decades. And, and really great that you could join us this evening. We will be uh, filming and doing uh, photography as well. And if you don't want to be photographed or, or filmed, if you could just let uh, some of the staff know uh, in, in the process. I wanted to begin by acknowledging that we're on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. Um, I'm going to just briefly introduce Libby because many of you have known her almost for three or four decades. I see some people in the audience that I know that have known Libby for a long time. Uh, she and her partner, Bruce Erickson, were key figures in the formation of the Downtown Eastside Resident Association in 1973. In 10 years of community organizing, Libby developed her strong grassroots approach to working with people in diverse communities. In 1982, Libby was elected to Vancouver City Council and served five uh, consecutive uh, terms. From 94 to 97, Libby worked with the Hospital Employees Union, serving in the role of <coughs> Ombudsperson for Human Rights, Complaints Investigator, Coordinator of Human Resources. And Libby was first elected as MP for Vancouver East in 1997. Uh, elected a number of times, serving uh, six terms over over 18 uh, years. So please uh, welcome uh, Libby Davies. In conversation with Libby is going to be Jackie Wong. She's a writer, editor, and writing instructor. Her journalism about housing, homelessness, and equality has been published across Canada. She's worked as an editor at Megaphone, a social enterprise employment opportunity for people experiencing po poverty, as a housing reporter for Thai Solution Society, and she's also an instructor in the community journalism program that we run with Megaphone. So please welcome Jackie Wong. Just uh, briefly on the, on the format of the evening, we're going to spend about 45 minutes in conversation with Libby, just uh, asking her questions from different eras of her community organizing and political life. And then we have at least another 45 minutes to take questions and comments uh, from the rest of you. We're going to set our little timer to make sure we don't go over uh, 45 minutes. So here we go. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm so glad to see so many lovely, happy faces here, and thank you so much, Libby, for joining us. Um, you know, here we are at Woodward's, and uh, as many people here have a, a long history in Vancouver, and, and Libby certainly does, we know that even on the most westerly tip of the downtown east side, this neighborhood engenders a certain kind of historical amnesia, because things change so, so fast. And, uh, and yet, you know, decades ago, Libby was here working on a newspaper called the Downtown East. And during that period, there was a small organization that was forming called the East Side Residents Association. I was wondering if you could tell us about that era. Well, thanks, Jackie. And first of all, um, thank you to Am and Jackie and SFU uh, Community Engagement Program. Uh, it's so great to be here and just have a uh, what I hope is going to be a really informal and good conversation. And don't worry, if I see you keep looking up, I, I, I'm sure the photographs are probably more interesting than looking at our faces. So, so just look up and look wherever you want. And uh, we know your ears are, are there too. Um, so yeah, those early days. Um, I mean, I first started working in this neighborhood in 1972 on a low-cost food store, which is on East Cordova Street. And in those days, you know, this was an invisible community. It wasn't seen as a community. It was still seen as Skid Road. And if you looked at any city map, um, it didn't exist. It was part of the Central Business District. And it was a very tumultuous time um, when DERA started, the Downtown Eastside Residents Association. And there may be people here who even remember what that time was like. But it was a time of... Uh, 
very militant organizing. It was like a union. It was, uh, and it was giving voice to people who had been silenced for many decades. Uh, and I, I just um, happened to sort of be there and become a part of it. And, and I think it really became a foundation for the kind of politics that I got involved in and how I saw change come about. So it was a great, uh, a great experience for, for a decade or more. I was going to jump in, you know, today a lot of social activists, they have the power of social media like Facebook and Twitter and organizing uh, can happen in that type of way. And the technology or the way that people organize at that time in the early 70s was very different. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you mobilized people, how you went through that work, because it's very different type of organizing. Oh, wow. Well, it's, it's like night and day. And now we think of everything in terms of you know social media and organizing on social media and that's a very powerful tool and you know I used it a lot as a member of parliament you know whether it's twitter or facebook or emails but back in in those early days of community organizing there was no such thing uh, it was literally slugging it out door to door and we were very fortunate we had this great little paper called the downtown east that we used to put out a couple of times a month and we had about 5000 copies or so and we we would go door to door in the hotels and rooming houses and knock on doors, distribute it to people, uh, talk to people. And, it, and, and I think that's still a very relevant way today to engage with people. Like Social media is a very important tool, but it, it, it shouldn't be the only tool. I mean, how many times have we all said, you know, we're going to like something and, and then we sort of like, oh, well, something else happened. So, you know, that kind of uh, one-to-one um, organizing and and interface with people where you actually hear what people's stories are. Uh, certainly having meetings. I mean, some of the DERA meetings, we would have you know, as many people in this room, maybe double. Um, and they were really powerful meetings. People jumping up at the mic and talking about um, how they were being screwed by their landlord. And I mean, nobody had had a place to do that. There'd be no space to talk about what was going on. And so the whole movement about uh, asserting people's rights in this community, uh, whether it was taking on landlords or, or the welfare department or city hall or whatever it might be, um, it was that interaction between people that forged um, an incredible solidarity that people could actually make something happen. And it was very powerful to, to be a part of that. I was going to jump in with a little follow-up. You mentioned uh, the early 70s, and, and now if you look at the Carnegie Center today, we all know it as a very well-used community center, a kind of living room uh, in the neighborhood. But at the time that you were organizing, uh, it wasn't a community center. That actually took the work of a lot of people. wondering if you can talk a little bit about that period of organizing uh, towards having it established as a, as a community center for the neighborhood. Well, first of all, it took about five years, and that's one thing I've learned about organizing. You know, to, in today's world, we sometimes expect things to happen very quickly, and sometimes things do happen quickly. But when you're organizing for change, for transformative change, you're, you're also talking about a lifetime of work, right? And things that, you know, you go forward and you go back and you go sideways, and sometimes you do a somersault. And certainly the Carnegie, um, it was a, you know, there'll be people here who maybe remember it as Vancouver's, it was the old Vancouver museum, but it was sitting derelict. It was going to be demolished by the city. And at the time, um, we wanted to, we did develop a campaign to point out that this was the only neighborhood in the city that had no community center and no library. And so we began a campaign to save the building, which, you know, maybe sounds like not a big deal, but it was a big deal because um, the city really didn't have any interest in doing that. Uh, now, we did have allies at City Hall. Uh, Harry Rankin was there, Darlene Mazzari, who was a wonderful young city councillor at the time. Um, so we, we learned how to work on the inside, but also organize people on the outside. And we began a campaign to, uh, to generate um, a commitment from the city of Vancouver. And I remember the pivot, you know, tactics are very important. We got Harry Rankin to um, get the city to open up the building. It was like full of cobwebs. It was dusty. I think there was still a few mummies hanging around, you know, from when it had been the museum. And we got him to hold the committee meeting 
in the building. And uh, he chaired the committee. It was the Community Services Committee. And there was a pivotal vote um, of, uh, I think it was like uh, three, four to three. Darlene Missouri moved the motion to allocate $650,000 from the um, city's capital campaign to renovate the Carnegie. And, and it was because it was in the building. You know, it just kind of changed the perception. First of all, they were on our territory. You know, they were on our ground. And it, it changed the whole dynamic. Of, we weren't at City Hall. We were fighting on our ground. And uh, so we got that through, and eventually we got the city to put up more money. Um, never the federal government. We had a big battle with the federal government. I remember they were putting money into Granville Island, and we painted all the hoardings around the building and put six million dollars for, and it sounds like nothing now in terms of infrastructure, but six million dollars for Granville Island, zero for Carnegie. So we were trying to beat back the feds and get some money out of them. But eventually the building opened and as you have pointed out, it's, it's an anchor in this community now. It's a very important space. Wow, you know, I think that one of the, the hallmarks of the way that you, you do this work and one reason why I think so many of us admire you is that you, you do it with such sincerity and such dedication and such compassion to show how change uh, really takes a lot of time. And so, you know, you talk about your beginnings in the downtown east side, uh, working with the downtown east um, in the early 1970s. We fast forward 10 years and it's 1982 and you make a, a run municipally with the coalition of progressive electors. And then you are elected for four more council terms. And now, you know, this is a new era for you and, and I'm really curious about how how you, how you shifted, what was the big shift between moving from working in politics on a grassroots level, um, doing that campaign at Granville Island, and then working more formally in uh, city council as an elected politician? Well, I, you know, it's one of those things that when you're doing it, you don't really think about it. It just sort of happens, and it's only maybe years later that you begin to reflect on, how the heck did I do that? Um, and I think for me, it was a big shift from sort of community-based politics, as you've said, into more formal politics where there were structures and rules. And, and we had to learn how to then maneuver and work and influence inside City Hall, how to work with civic staff, how to, how to get the bureaucracy on board. And, and I think we, you know, we learned through sort of trial and error because nobody teaches you this stuff. Uh, certainly, you know, um, Harry Rankin was a, a mentor. And when I look back now, I realize that a lot of my mentors, political mentors were men. There were very few women in or progressive women politics at that time. And so a lot of these, you know, these colorful figures who were around at the time. Um, I think the other big shift was, you know, when you're in a, a local community, you're very focused on that community and what needs to be done. And then all of a sudden being at City Hall, there's a multiple of issues, you know, whether it's um, development or community planning or sewers or traffic or transit, you know, you're suddenly confronted with a whole diversity of issues and you, you learn to navigate that. And, and I, I've always felt like it's sort of a mile wide but an inch deep. You know, I got to know a little bit about sewers and engineering and street lights and, and, and you just learn by the doing. I mean, I think that's been sort of the way I've done it my whole life and you make mistakes along the way, but you also rely on people um, that you trust to to work with you and to learn from those people and I think that's a very important thing in politics that we we take the time to mentor young people. I feel like I had that uh, and I think it's very important in today's world that young people have that sense of mentorship um, to, to make the political world, especially the formal political world, more accessible to them. Uh, during your time on council, you, you mentioned uh, Harry Rankin, who was a, a big political personality, but there were many, many others that you worked alongside. Mike Harcourt, who became yep. a future premier, Gordon Campbell, George Puel, Philip <laughs> Owen, who became a future mayor. Yep. Wondering if you can maybe share some uh, uh, memories of, of working alongside that period of, of council. You know? Well, um, you know, they used to... Um, they used to say that you know the city council meetings were like a live soap opera, and people used to tune in. They liked to see George Puel in a row with Harry Rankin, and and uh, and you get pretty good at debating. But um, you know it's funny. You you also become very friendly with people. Like over the years, I got to know Philip Owen very well. Even though we ran against each other for mayor, we were still like really good friends. And and shared a lot in common. Uh, George Puel, I remember at first being terrified of the guy. You know, he was uh, kind of gruff and, and he was, I think, a teacher at Kitts High School and, 
and but eventually, you know, you kind of find your confidence and you, you realize that you, you do have a voice. Um, but, I mean, Gordon Campbell, <laughs> um, I mean, he, he changed City Hall dramatically in terms of the sort of the democratic functioning. He made it much more uh, the way the provincial government works. So, I mean, one thing I really love about civic politics is that it's always been more egalitarian, right? The debates, like every single person on council counts. There's no cabinet per se. There's no hierarchy. Each person is there in their own right, having been elected in the election. He, he shifted that to somewhat. He kind of created an inner circle. And there was one period where it was just Bruce and myself who survived. That was the 86 election, um, just after, ex, uh, after Expo. I cut... I can't remember whether it was before or after. Um, but there was just the two of us, right? And it was a fairly right-wing council, and they started tearing apart civic services and cutting library hours and community centers. And, and again, it became really important to work with the community to develop a base to take on what was happening at City Hall. Uh, but I always enjoyed, uh, I mean, old Warnett Kennedy, you know, it was a, it was a funny old guy. I remember Nathan Davinsky, he was a math professor from UBC on the MPA. He used to come to city council meetings, always eating a banana. And I used to sit there and watch this guy just steadily eating away on his banana, you know, through the council meeting. And it's like, oh, well, that's his thing, you know. So <laughs> there, were, there were some characters, that's for sure. I always wondered how people stayed sated at city council meetings because they are hungry affairs. Um, but then, you know, you, you moved through all of that and you were still, you know, Bruce and you were two progressive people on council. And then it came to the early 90s when you decided to make a run for mayor yourself. What was that like? Well, you know, I've always felt like I never really planned anything in my life. Things kind of happen. And I can't say that I was the most eager person to run. There was sort of an expectation that I would run for mayor in 1993. We've never had a woman mayor in Vancouver, which is really quite incredible if you think about it. Um, there have been some really excellent women who have run. Um, and, uh, but in 93, uh, I have to say, Jackie, it was a bit of a disaster. I don't think we were prepared. Um, as I say, there was this expectation that we would do well. Uh, we didn't. It was, um, it was one of those experiences where we had the civic election, and 10 days prior to that, we'd had the federal election. That was 93, and it was the time of all of the Meech Lake and the Charlottetown Accord, and there was a, and the NDP dropped from 44 seats, 43 seats, down to nine. Um, and uh, uh, Margaret Mitchell, who some of you may remember, lost Vancouver East, and people were just devastated, like couldn't believe it that we'd lost Vancouver East, and 10 days later was the civic election. So we lost volunteers. So it was, it was a really good experience, um, and, and I don't ever regret doing that. You should never regret anything. You learn from it, right? Uh, but I realize now, um, looking back, that we were, we, we were not prepared. It was important that we run, um, and I'm glad I did it, because I learned a lot, but, um, but it, was, it was a pretty bad campaign. <laughs> And we did a lot of things wrong. And, and you know, in elections, I've learned that there's, there's forces at work that, some, that you, can, you can try to deal with, and sometimes they just override you. And I think it was one of those instances. And in that election, we ended up with one person on city council, which was a very young Jenny Kwan, who became a, a Cope city councillor. And, and that was it. We lost every other seat. I was going to ask you about that period between <clears throat> civic politics and running for federal politics where you worked with the Hospital Employees Union. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit uh, about that period because that was probably one of the more less public roles of your, of, of your life in terms of, of moving between politics. Yeah. Well, when I left City Hall, um, you know, there's no pension plan. There's, you know, the wages were very low. And uh, I actually, it was friends who, came, like Bruce and I literally uh, could not pay the next month's rent. <laughs> he had retired from city politics. And uh, so November of 1993, and if it hadn't been for wonderful friends who kind of came together and, and picked up a few months' rent uh, of our place uh, in East Vancouver, we would have been, had a really hard time. Um, and it took me a while to find work. And it, it's one of the things I've learned is that, you know, um, 
generally speaking, uh, men are a lot better at like getting out and selling themselves and promoting and getting a job. And I, I really, I didn't fall apart, N not, nothing like that at all. But I wasn't very good at thinking like how could I get back into the job market? And it took me actually a while to um, sort of find my feet. And uh, eventually, as, as you pointed out, I was hired by the Hostel Employees Union, which is a, a, an amazing union, uh, very membership-based, very active. And I basically did their um, kind of human resources. So it was very different because one, I was at a desk. Two, I was dealing with internal human resource issues. Um, and uh, and it, it was it was a totally different kind of work for me. But for for a number of years, I had been a human rights complaints officer for them, even when I'd been at City Hall. So I was very familiar with the union, and it was a very good place for me. And I was very grateful to them that they they opened their doors to me, and I, I had sort of a, a place eventually to go to and and to have a, a good workplace. You know, it's really heartening to to hear that there is still this there is this struggle. I mean, it is it's not a it's not an easy struggle. It's not heartening to hear that people are out of work. But I think it's important that you vocalize how uh, how work happens oftentimes along gender lines, and um, and it's a reflection of inequalities that exist here. And um, you know, after after this period of working at the hospital employees union, I think that's a really significant part of life to hear about because it's a less part of your public life. But uh, but you found you, you you had another job by 1997. You were elected as the new MP for Vancouver East, and the NDP was in Vancouver East again. Mm -hmm. um, by this time, uh, the United Nations had declared a public health emergency in the downtown East Side, and I was you know you were you were then still an MP for the next five terms and in Ottawa. Um, I'm curious about how the downtown east side influenced your work in Ottawa as an MP. Uh, that's a good question, Jackie. I mean, I have to say that my experience in the community, the people I knew, the, the connections I had um, were, I mean, it's what motivated me. And the very first issue that I worked on was the you know the hundreds of people who were dying from drug overdoses and it was it was a crisis it was a health crisis much as we see today now still with fentanyl um, but back in 1997 um, you know politicians were expected to quiver with rage about drug users on the street you know it was illegal lock them up throw away the key you know the the visibility of the issue um, much like sort of the criminalization of poverty because of its visibility. Um, so it was a tough issue to take on. And I remember, the, the thing I remember with such clarity is um, the, uh, the folks at the Portland Hotel and a, a group called the Political Response Bo Group that Bud Osborne was involved with, they organized an event at Oppenheimer Park called uh, the Killing Fields. And they put up 1,000 wooden crosses in the park to represent um, every person who had died of a drug overdose over the preceding uh, couple of years or so. And I went to it, and it was, um, I mean, it's something that you could not, I mean, you, if you went to something like that, you knew you had to do something. This was be just before I went to Ottawa. And so I went to Ottawa with this in my head. I'd, I'd made a connection with Bud and people like Anne Livingston and, and other people at Van Du. And I knew, I didn't know how to do it, but I knew that when I got to Ottawa, this is what I had to take on, that and homelessness were the two big issues um, that somehow I had to make visible in Ottawa. I wasn't sure how to do it, but once I got there, it was actually my instincts and my experience as a community organizer that, um, that led me forward. Like I, I knew what I had to do. I knew I had to get outside of Parliament. It was important to make connections inside Parliament, particularly with the Liberal government of the day, and I was very fortunate that I, I, I was able to meet with Alan Rock, who was then the Minister of Health, because at that time the Liberal government was certainly not in favor of a safe injection site. Um, and it was a big battle to take on. There were people here working locally, uh, both uh, in terms of the scientific community, there were political allies, certainly groups like Van Du that really transformed the debate. Once the, and this is a, another big political lesson for me. When people use their own voice, it, it is something that is so powerful and it, it can't be refuted. And so it was that voice where I could become an ally in Ottawa to take up that message um, that, you know, bit by bit we were able to, um, 
you know, keep the pressure up and eventually um, ensure that uh, uh, Insight was opened and, 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 the, and the heroin maintenance program and so on. Um, but they, it all took a lot of, you know, kind of battles inside and outside of people working together. But it was the people in the community that kept me motivated and informed about what was going on. Uh, over the course of uh, the 18 years you were an MP, you saw a lot of um, federal NDP leaders come through and, yeah. and also leaders in other political parties. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about kind of the trajectory and the time that you spent uh, inside of caucus uh, and, and the kind of dynamics that played out over that kind of long period. Yeah. I mean, interestingly, um, I'd never been that active in the NDP. I'd always worked for the NDP in election campaigns, but I did not consider myself like a, you know, a party activist. My, my politics really came from the community. So when I got to Ottawa and was sort of um, confronted with the fact that I was part of a caucus and learning what that was about, it was really kind of new territory. And um, the first leader that I encountered was Alexa McDonough, and she came from, the, uh, from um, Atlantic Canada, Nova Scotia, and she kind of revived the NDP. And I, I, I didn't know Alexa, um, and I, I, I gained enormous respect for her, and I would characterize, characterize her as the person who always brought consensus. And sometimes she got creamed because of that. You know, again, there's, there's, uh, there's tremendous sexism that's still around, even within, you know, a political party like the NDP. And, and, and so, you know, sometimes when women try to bring that consensus, it can be characterized as weakness, right? Uh, or, if you, or if you make uh, a unilateral decision because you're the leader, well, then you're, you're being, you know, too aggressive. But I saw... Alexa as the, first of all, she was a great peace advocate. She was very involved in peace and disarmament issues. Um, but um, just a, a really wonderful person who, who helped build that caucus. Um, the next leader, um, of course, was Jack Layton. And I, I, would, I, would, I, I see Jack as sort of Jack the Builder. In fact, isn't there a kid's toy named that? It was like Jack the Builder. But he was the builder, right? He was the guy, sorry? Oh, Bob the Builder. Okay, this was Jack the Builder. Um, and he, he was the guy who really, um, when he ran, I think he had many similar um, sentiments that I did about trying to bring the NDP out of the parliamentary and legislative world into the community and being part of a bigger movement. And that's something that's always fascinated me over the years is that intersection of electoral politics and social movement politics and how sometimes it's very fractured by, um, by lack of understanding or mistrust. But Jack was the guy who, who wanted to build out, build the party and also build out. And he, and as we know, he did a pretty amazing job and he, he became the, uh, the leader of the official opposition and he was a very, I mean, people loved him in this country. He was a great leader. And, and then the next leader I worked with was Thomas Mulcair, who of course is still the leader of the NDP until um, October of 2017. And I would characterize um, Mulcair as really someone who brought a lot more discipline. He had been a cabinet minister in the Quebec government. And I know when I say discipline, some people may interpret that in a, in a, like a negative, restrictive way. And, and maybe there are elements of that. But, but I think in a way he brought a discipline to us as an official opposition that we had to be an official opposition. We had to be credible. We had to know what we were doing. We had to be disciplined. And because of his experience, I think he was able to bring that as a leader to his caucus and, and to the party. And uh, um, so though, you know, those are a little, little bit about those three leaders. I wanted to pick up on, um, on, on some notes that you had shared just now about the bridge between electoral politics and, mm -hmm. and social movement politics. And uh, in the early 2000s and 2001, um, when you were an MP for Vancouver East, you revealed your relationship with Kim Elliott, who's here in this audience now. And uh, hi, Kim. Um, at the time, though, this was this was a big moment in, um, in in electoral politics. You were then the first out female member of parliament yeah. in 2001. Um, I'm curious about what you think has changed since, between then and now in terms of queer visibility in politics and electoral politics. Well, I, I think a lot has changed. Um, you know, Sven Robinson was the first openly gay member of parliament in 1988, and he faced death threats, and his office had bricks thrown through it, and 
Um, he, you know, he had a really, it was a very difficult time. Uh, in 2001, um, it, I mean, it was very different. Um, it, you know, it was still news, although I didn't expect it to be news. Um, but I think now, uh, what, 15 years later, to me, the visibility of, of uh, gay and lesbian trans people in politics is, is just, I mean, people don't even... Um, you know, it's just part now of the diversity of, of politics, as it should be. I think there's still a lot of issues to work on, particularly internationally, uh, and I became more involved in international issues where, um, you know, uh, men who have sex with men, uh, the, 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 the queer community people are, are persecuted, They're, they face violence, even death. So there's huge issues still to work on, even with, in Canada, in terms of the trans community and the fight for recognition of rights. But I think generally, in terms of the political realm, um, there's a great acceptance now of, of queer politicians. I mean, you look at the, the Premier of Ontario. I mean, it, it's, it's something that is welcomed. It's something that's seen as a strength. Um, and I think that's just wonderful. And it just shows, you know, how change can come about. And, and when, you, when you are who you are and you have that pride about what you do, no matter who you are, whether, whether you're a woman, whether you are a person with a disability or someone from the Aboriginal community, all of the groups that have been underrepresented, you know, like Ottawa is still a domain of pretty well old white guys. I mean, that's still there. And, it, and that happens all over. But as, as representation changes, and certainly this parliament has got a much greater diversity, um, it's a really affirming, powerful thing to see. And it's something that we have to keep working at because I think it's, you know, uh, rights are never given. They're always won. And you have to be vigilant about them. I've learned that over the years. And that's true for LGBTQ rights, that we have to be vigilant and make sure that that presence in the political arena is real and meaningful. And it's not just sort of a token thing. I was going to say, the two other uh, movements I really associate um, you with, Libby, is uh, uh, the women's movement and the housing movement. And you've been sort of a witness to those social movements over four decades. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to uh, the different ways that you uh, came across and advanced those issues going from the 70s right to uh, being a member of parliament uh, in terms of how you saw those movements uh, emerge go up, re-emerge, and, and, and how they evolved? Well, um, I, I, I think I can say that of all the issues I've worked on, probably the issue of housing as a human right is something that, it, it's like part of my political DNA. Um, I, it's something I first experienced working in this neighborhood and going through the hotels and rooming houses, getting to know people, fighting with the city to enforce standards of maintenance, uh, enforcing the fire bylaws so people weren't dying in fires. Um, and Jackie and I were talking earlier, you know, but back in those days, there wasn't homelessness. You didn't see people destitute on the street. People were poor, but they could still you know, afford a cup of coffee at the Ovaltine Cafe. Uh, they might live in a crappy hotel or rooming house, but it was still shelter. People weren't destitute on the street. Um, and, it, and it's been the failure of... In fact, that's why I ran in 1997. It was because the, the government of the day under Paul Martin had completely cancelled social housing in Canada. We had had a fantastic track record in this country of social housing, co-ops, um, not-for-profit housing, seniors housing, special needs housing, Aboriginal housing, and it, it came to a crashing halt um, in the name of, you know, dealing with the deficit. It was basically on the backs of poor people. And so that theme of uh, fighting for housing and working with the community, I, I went to Ottawa sort of seized with that issue, and I worked with... Um, great organizations like the National Housing and Homelessness Alliance, people like Michael Shapcott in Toronto and Kathy Crow. Um, and, and it was a matter of creating pressure on the inside as well as in the community because housing was not on the political agenda. But the, but the thing that really disturbs me is that today it is still really the critical issue in Metro Vancouver. And, and in some ways it's even worse. And, and I keep saying to myself, how can that be? And I, and I know the answer. The answer is because it's dominated by the marketplace, right? And more and more people are falling out the bottom of that whole system, right? And we see massive speculation. We see housing prices spiral out of control. Um, and so 
this basic human issue of, of safe, secure, stable housing becomes something that affects more and more people. So I, I wish I could say that over you know, uh, 30 years that we'd made a lot more progress. And we did have, we, we did get to some points, like when we had an NDP government here, you were involved in that, in 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 developing good housing uh, in BC, right, from, from the provincial government. But the federal government, once it left that arena, I mean, it's taking us decades to get back to a place where it's seen as an essential component of, of a just society. And so I think we're still tr struggling with that. And if we leave it to you know, developers in the speculative marketplace, then we're screwed. We really are. And I think we're living that today in this city. So I, I feel, I feel you know, we've still got a lot of work to do there. And there's still a lot of things that we need to take on. And there is so much work to do. And you've done so much work. Um, I'm just going to flag that we're, uh, I I'm going to ask this one last question from myself and we have time for one more from Am before we open it up to, to all of the many of you. Um, but you know, when you, when you talk about housing and when you talk about this life in politics, you've served more terms as a member of parliament and a city councillor than a lot of people have in a lifetime. And I was curious about what you know, what, what helped you through the really hard times? You worked on a lot of really tough issues and what kept you going in terms of resilience when things were really hard? Well, I, th I think it's um, possibly the same for any of us. It's when you feel deeply, st strongly, passionately about something um, and you don't want to give up. And when you work with people who are um, really dedicated and inspiring, it, it just keeps you moving. And, you know, I did find times in Ottawa where I thought, wow, this is such a crazy place. You know, it's its own little world. It's a weird little world. It's completely artificial. But it was always coming back to East Vancouver that kept me grounded and meeting with people in the local community because that's where my connection was. You know, it's, it's, it's easy, and I've seen people... MPs get sucked into that Ottawa scene where they get all wound up about the intrigue and who's doing what to whom and you know all the internalized politics and and I think because of my own background and because of the really great people that I was able to work with that's what kept me strong and motivated and that doesn't mean to say you don't have bad days <laughs> you know we all do um, but when you when you feel you're a part of something when you have that sense of solidarity with people that you're working with and and I think Jackie this is the most important lesson I learned in politics it's the trust that you develop with people when you have that trust when people trusted me to do what I needed to do, and they gave me space to do it, and when I trusted the people I was working with, then it, it, it empowers you, it gives you a determination, and I, I really think that's what keeps you going. And, and I, I, I hope that's something that's true for all of us, right? You have to find that, that connection with people, and there's so much that can divide us. And I, you know, I've seen people fighting, and I feel sometimes terrible when I see the fighting or the fractures that take place on the left, or you know, when people going at it. And it's like, come on, people! Like we have so much here that we need to stay together for, right? To move forward, and let's learn who the real adversaries are. That's not each other. Right? There are big forces out there that are real adversaries. Um, and so I think it's that understanding, and, and, but it's working with people. I, at the end of the day, I would say it's really that simple. It's how you work with people and the trust that you have. I was going to say, Libby, you've had some uh, well-earned time away from politics the past few months. And I know from the article in the Georgia Strait with uh, Charlie Smith that you're working on your memoirs right now, and you're also thinking about politics and social movements. I wonder if you can speak a little bit about what you're thinking about and what you're writing on, because we also, we would love to, of course, host your book launch here when it comes out, so. <laughs> well, let's hope we get there, Em. <laughs> um, no, I've, I've really um, enjoyed a really good year of, um, you know, a transition. I, I haven't regretted leaving the formal political world, but, you know, the political environment overall is, pretty big in my life and it will always be there and I'll um, I, and I'm, I will engage somewhere at some point but I it's true for the last uh, few months I've been uh, writing and and uh, I, I touched on a, a, a bit of it actually it's 
I'm, I'm really fascinated by how change takes place. Like what causes transformative change to happen in our society? What are the ingredients? What are the things that we need to learn? And, and I think in politics, for me, it's not only what you stand for. That's very important. It's how you do your work, right? It's how you do your politics. And, and so I'm writing about that. How does change happen? What is, what is that connection or lack of connection sometimes between the uh, formal political world and the, uh, the activism world. And I feel like I've moved back and forth between the two over the years, and I've had connections between the two. And so I want to explore that. I'm gonna go talk to other activists across the country, so it's, you know, it's not just my voice. My experience is there, but I wanna talk to other people. And I'm hoping that it will be um, some writing that will um, give people a, um, a sense of hope about what we can do when we, when we make those connections, when we understand what's going on around us and we actually understand our own power to make change. Um, and it's something that we all have to learn. So that's, that's kind of a long-winded way of saying a little bit about what's going to be in that book. <laughs> and a few stories, too. <laughs> And secrets. <laughs> I just wanted to say Maybe. thank you so much for sharing the stage with us in, in oh. your life. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we, we, so we have uh, about 45 minutes for questions and comments. And I know that a number of you will have uh, uh, things to say. So what we might do is to... Uh, go to three questions or, or comments and let Libby respond and then we'll go back uh, out to the audience. We have a few people with microphones who are here and so if you just put up your, your hands you'll get a microphone that will um, get out. So, yes sir. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. My question is, are there any plans for making a documentary about your life and your journey? And my second question is about the, the relationship between NDP and Green Party, which to many of the youths is the most progressive party. Do you think there is any hope of some kind of marriage or between the two parties or any, any signs as a, as a challenge to patriarchy to form a women's party or whatever, or a democratic Green Party? Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm Patrick Foley. I like to say uh, you're looking good out of politics. Uh, <laughs> and um, um, I'd like to ask you about uh, Bruce Erickson. What if influence he had on on your uh, political life? Can I ask another question too? Sure. And my second question is uh, <clears throat> the future of the downtown east side. I really don't like the way it's going with the gentrification and uh, the rich people and the poor people still not together. Uh, what do you suggest uh, maybe people could do to make it more uh, human rather than conflictual? Well, thank you for the questions. Actually, does somebody have a pen I could borrow so I don't forget what the questions were? What? Okay. I want to just make sure that Libby has a chance to catch the questions. Shauna Sylvester. Libby, it's a very personal question. Um, I grew up very much as an activist, and somewhere along the way, working in South Asia, it's here, Shauna, and somewhere along the way, I, I, I work at the Center for Dialogue and shifted away from an activism role to being very much around dialogue and convening groups that, that don't agree and putting the focus there. Um, I think it's really hard to be in an institution like politics and to retain that solid activism that you have retained. So I'm interested in, in terms of your thinking around social movements. I, I often am pulled back and wanting that activist side, but knowing that if I go there, I can't convene anymore. Mm -hmm. And I suspect there's some of that that happens when you're, uh, you're trying to make things happen across the floor. <clears throat> in Parliament. So I'm, I'm wondering how you kept that and still did the work that you do. Is How did you retain that solid activist core 
which I always look to you for, um, while still being successful uh, working across parties to advance the things that you needed to work, advance? Okay, great questions. Um, movie, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know anything about that. Um, I, I want to get through my writing, and uh, that's what I'm focused on. As far as the Green Party and the NDP, I mean, this is a, this is a long-term question, and it's uh, pretty complicated and not something that's easy to answer in, a, in, a, in 60 seconds. Um, I, I, I do think that in politics, um, it, it, we get the best when we have when we have commonality of people working together. Uh, like, people go to a political party because of what they're drawn to, right, for what that party stands. But that, that's not mutually exclusive to parties learning how to work together. And some of the best examples we've had of that in politics is when we've had minority parliaments um, or minority governments or parliaments in Ottawa. And so the idea that you can cooperate, like I don't want to become a Green Party member, I want to be a New Democrat for a whole number of reasons. But that doesn't mean that I don't think we shouldn't seek ways to cooperate and collaborate. And, and sometimes that did happen in Ottawa. More, more often than you probably realize, because most people when they see politics, they see question period, right? Which is very combative and it's very partisan, it's hyper-partisan. And there is actually more cooperation that goes on behind the scenes, uh, particularly if there is a minority situation. So, I mean, I think that's always something to strive for. And again, it takes that kind of trust to develop those, re re those relationships. Um, as far as the question about Bruce Erickson, well, I mean, Bruce Erickson was an enormous influence on my life, both politically and personally. I mean, we were, we were together for 24 years. Uh, we have a son, Leif Erickson, who's now 37. Um, and Bruce was an incredible figure in this community. Um, he was, he was, um, he was determined, he was fierce, he took shit from nobody, um, he took on City Hall, and really, if, if I strip it all away, that's where I learned my politics, was working with him over many years in this community. Um, and, and even then, you know, we were facing issues of gentrification. I was saying to Jackie and Am before we came here, you know, uh, in the 70s, most of these buildings in Gastown were, were residential. They were hotels and rooming houses, and so much has gone. So the gentrif gentrification that's taken over this neighborhood has been um, unforgiving and merciless. And I think it comes back to the question of, to me, there's a fundamental question that is not only about this neighborhood, but is about our society, and that is, do poor people have the right to live in wealthy real estate, right? Here we are on the east side of the downtown, some of the wealthiest, um, the most expensive real estate in North America, if not globally now. Um, and what, you know, some people would say that, well, if you're poor and you live on a disability pension or you're on welfare, that you have no right to live here, that the marketplace will dictate what happens. Now see, I don't agree with that. I think we have to fight against that. And we have to say that there have to be interventions at every level to ensure that when, when we're talking about people's home, they have a right to security and stability. I mean, can you imagine what would happen in this city if we suddenly decided that Dunbar was gonna be obliterated? People would go crazy. Right? They would say, what the hell's that about? That, you know, that can't happen. Well, this is a community too. This is where people live uh, and, and need to have that stability too. So it's a, it's a huge issue that's still facing us. And I, I think it's something that involves all three levels of government. But fundamentally, it is about um, what we are prepared to do in the public interest in terms of uh, the housing market and whether or not we're willing to agree and take strong measures to say that housing is a human right and therefore we have to make some pretty serious interventions to make sure that, that the housing is saved. And I mean, that's what the struggle is about, isn't it? Um, to, uh, to Shauna, I mean, it's a very interesting question you raise about when you work in a more institutional setting, how do you how do you keep that connection? I think it was actually easier for me because being a member of parliament, in some ways I had more of an open space 
to, to do my own work. I had a, a writing that I was accountable to, right? And, and so that gives me, it gave me um, fortitude and, and uh, 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 a license, if you will, from running an election to take that on. I think if you're in an institutional setting, whether it's a university or a, a corporation or even a very large community organization, it's very hard to do. And I think what I've learned is that often the struggle is more internal, right? Um, some of the biggest battles I had were inside the NDP and within the caucus and taking on different issues and working them through. And I, I think that's what happens. And you have to find allies internally as well as externally for the issue that you're working on. I mean, you know as much as me. You, I mean, I'm sure you have answers too, but it, it's a hard one to navigate. And I can only say that it's by having those relationships and those allies with you um, and realizing that you can't take everything on. I mean, I've learned over the years to kind of you have to determine where you're gonna, you know, what's the hill to die on, you know? Uh, where, where you're gonna really line it all up and say, okay, this is what we're going for and know what the forces are with you and what, what obstacles you face. And it's a, it's a very strategic, methodical thing that you have to take on when you do that. Uh, but it, I think it's something that you can work your way through. I don't know if that helps you at all. <laughs> we'll go back out to uh, question up here. Uh, my name is Sandy Bauer. We've met before. Hi, Sandy. <laughs> um, my question has to do with the battle I see that we're losing that addresses all of these um, situations is the small government is good, all taxes are bad. <clears throat> and without taxes, without recognizing that taxes is what gives, gives us a civilized society, um, it's really hard to work on these issues as sort yeah. of one at a time, find funding for this, find funding for that. The right seems to have done such a good job, and I don't see that being countered on the left. Mm -hmm. I mean, not the left politically. Mm -hmm. You know, um, BC, BC, Klein. <laughs> mm -hmm. The PC what? CCPA, thank you. Okay. You know, groups like that. But I don't politically, sometimes we hear the mm -hmm. opposite. Oh, no, mm -hmm. we won't raise taxes. You know, just want your thoughts on that whole topic. Yeah, great. Uh, go ahead. Your question right there. Oh, hi. Um, I just have a question about uh, what's your suggestions for young people, like, you know, new recent grads or young women uh, who's very interested in politics? and community engagement and um, how can we get involved. And also, uh, I'll give you a little bit about my background. I born and raised in China. So I came to Canada eight years ago. I mean, in China, like, uh, we don't have you know, that much opportunity mm -hmm. as uh, students or as uh, young people to really get involved with community engagement, uh, with um, politics, right? So I really appreciate that um, in here in Canada, in Vancouver, I have a lot of opportunity to get really involved in community engagement on, and politics. So I'm just, just wondering about what's the, your suggestions. And yeah, thank you. Sir, did you have a question as well? Yeah, good evening. I, I'm Craig Langston. And when you talk about transformative change, uh, I really want to see that in, regar in regards to accessibility, because I see accessibility becoming a higher and higher priority, uh, especially with an aging population. And uh, is that kind of change on the radar in Ottawa as far as uh, the, the, the advancing of uh, accessibility uh, across this country? Uh, and he, he'd be able to provide more resources for families dealing with Alzheimer's and dementia? Well, uh, all, all really good questions. And uh, to Sandy, just raising this whole issue of, uh, you know, taxes and, and, and how that falls either way, left or right, and how people see it. Um, I, I, I do think it's a, a fundamental question, and it's, you know, it's related to how 
for many reasons, we've allowed the right to take over language, you know? Like the whole family values thing, and government is bad, and taxes are bad. You know, I can remember when we didn't used to talk about taxpayers, we used to talk about citizens, right? But now, I mean, in Ottawa, it was always the taxpayers, right? And so it, it begins to shift in terms of, um, uh, of, of how you characterize decisions being made and in whose interest it's made. And so I, I think, you know, political parties are, are very dynamic. They are very influenced by public discourse and public opinion and by polls. Um, and in order to kind of keep on a strong progressive path, we need to have allies that are willing to be critical, that are willing to speak out and are willing to validate um, a direction that recognizes the incredible importance of not only taxation, but progressive taxation, and dealing with probably one of the biggest issues in our society, which is income inequality, right? Is the growing gap between wealth and poverty, where we see obscene wealth and we see incredibly deepening poverty. This is probably the biggest issue of our time, coupled with uh, the degradation of the environment. And so uh, changing that public discourse, this is something that we all have a role. We can't leave it to political parties to do. We all have to find a way to participate in that, um, to change that discourse and to make it a positive discourse that taxes are about our ability to pay to make a society fair and just and functioning for the future generations, right? Um, and, and sometimes we lose that, we lose sight of it. Um, and so that actually takes me over to the next question, which was about young people and engagement. And I would say there are so many different ways to engage politically. You know, you can run for office, you can become involved in a political party, in a campaign, you can work with a local group, an NGO. You have to find that access point that you feel comfortable about, that you feel you can engage with. But the only thing I would say is that I really want to see a lot more interaction between activism politics and what I'll loosely call electoral politics. Um, if, if, if activism was more engaged in the political process um, in, a, in a very strategic, methodical, intelligent way, I think we'd see a lot more changes take place. But sometimes we work at loggerheads, sometimes we work at cross purposes. Um, but when, when those two forces come together, you know, uh, um, activists and working with political allies on the inside, then you can see incredible changes take place. So in terms of young engagement, um, this is something that I think we have to, we have to mentor, we have to, uh, we have to make sure that people are heard. Um, again, it gets back to this question of it's not only what you stand for, it's how we do our politics. It's about creating space, right? The answers are in this room. Right? and in the group that you might be involved with, but often those voices are not heard. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've, I've seen politics that can be very dominating, right? Um, particularly in terms of a male domination where people feel there's this sense of entitlement. We've got to get away from that. We've got to get to a space where, where people's experience is coming forward because then I think we'll learn that we have uh, many of the answers that we need, whether it's the downtown east side or any other community. And in terms of um, transformative change and disability, um, I mean, I think a lot has changed over the years. Uh, I remember when I was at City Hall and we had the first committee on disability issues and the city began to adopt something that was called universal design. And I thought, what, what, a, what a simple but utterly important thing to do, to change laws so that buildings were built uh, for all people, whether disabled or not, because we're all going to age, right? So whether it's like grab bars and baths and showers or whether it's accessible doors or washrooms or counters, right? This actually should be a universal thing. It shouldn't be separated out. 
that it's for people with disabilities. This is about a universality that we all benefit from. And, and we see that with public transit. I mean, even something as simple as putting curbs on sidewalks. I can remember when the sidewalks in this city didn't have any of those cutouts, right? Um, so it's something that can be done at all three levels. But like anything, you, we have to be vigilant, right? Because governments can get complacent, other priorities take, take hold. So this is again where the voice of the community and keeping the pressure on becomes very important to make sure that we A, don't lose what we've gained and B, that we keep moving forward on, on those accessibility issues. Great, we've got time for three more questions. Go ahead. Libby, I asked you this question 18 years ago of you, you and Stuart Parker. Uh, it is, of course, what do you think of direct democracy, particularly in view of the current close to frenzy about proportional representation, we might even get it. What do you think now, after 18 years of direct democracy? Thank you. We have another question? Yeah, um, I, I, I just so wanted to start out by saying thanks. And I was wondering why I want to say thanks. I'm over here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> and it's because I realize, like, whenever I get, I have been disillusioned with politics, generally in Canada, all levels, there was always this feeling like, there's always Libby. <laughs> you know, like, there's somebody good in there. So I, I want to thank you for doing that for me. And I also did want to ask one question. Um, I wondered if you have seen the musical Bruce, the oh, musical, yeah. and what you thought of it. And that's it. Great. And we have time for one more. Hi. Um, I did hear you mentioned a few times about how we can't leave uh, the discourse for only pol political parties to sort out, and you mentioned about improving the interaction between activists and electoral politics. My question is, what kind of barriers have you seen over your experience in politics for that to happen? Wow, you guys have good questions. One I think more? that there's just oh, one. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, Christy Clark Ghostbusting, I am. You knew of me. City Hall cannot be trusted. These are the words from Chairperson Granville Woodland Community Center. And I have a notice for you. I am handicapped myself and I am very vulnerable of your corruption. City Hall must answer to me. I own everything. What's the the railroad, I, my ancestors built. You're not going to cause genocide up north. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. OK, well, thank you for all the questions. They're great questions. Um, you know what, I think I do remember you from 18 years ago on that question. And if, if by direct democracy, do you mean referendums? Citizen right. Um, you know what, I still have some mixed feelings about it. I think it, I, and I think if I've changed at all on the question, it would be if there were clear and fair rules um, I know that some citizen-initiated referendums that could be legally binding, for example, in, this, in the United States or other countries, um, you know, sometimes you can, you can take, like I've seen issues that involve human rights, like we've seen um, initiatives in Oregon, right, um, trying to uh, fight against um, uh, human rights for gay and lesbians, right? Um, so it can go both ways. I mean, we've seen other referendums where other rights were at issue, uh, like trying to um, 
uh, trying to uh, uh, clamp down on so-called aliens, right, or, or, or illegal immigrants. Um, so I've always been very wary of it, recognizing that it's a very powerful tool that can be used actually to diminish people's rights. Um, and the, one of the most recent ones that came up was a referendum in Ireland over gay marriage. And I remember putting out a tweet and saying, you know, it was fantastic that the referendum passed, but, but I really worried that, that a question of people's rights had to be put to a referendum. And then somebody pointed out to me that it actually was required under the Constitution or something like that. So, I mean, I think in principle I don't have a problem, but it, it has more to do with what are the rules of engagement. Because if it creates an unlevel playing field where a group that's backed by very powerful interests can trample on the rights of another group that are not as well organized, then like, I, I kind of feel like it's a bit perverse. So, you know, I kind of have mixed feelings about it still, to tell you the truth. Um, thank you for your kind words at the back. And I, I just want to say, you know, there's lots of good people in politics. And we, we need to, and, and the more when ordinary people run, the better it gets. And I always try to get that across to people, right? We shouldn't leave it to the powerful and the elites and the business people and the, the lawyers, with all respect to lawyers. Um, you know, like when ordinary people get involved and even run for public office, it's usually a, a very good and sound thing. So I, I've always felt like I was never alone, right? I've, I've always felt like the strength was working with other people. Um, who inspired me. Um, so that's what we have to do, all of us. Um, I have seen Bruce the Musical. It was a, it's a wonderful um, musical, wonderful songs and story. And, uh, and I've got the CD of it, so thank you for bringing it up. And uh, the last question was um, the barriers. Very good question. What are the barriers between that change? Well, there's a lot of barriers. Um, because sometimes political parties they can get very focused on only wanting to be elected, raising money, especially as they get closer to a campaign. Um, and, and that can overtake right, a, a bigger political agenda. Uh, sometimes um, social movement activists and, and organizations can get very disenchanted with political parties and feel like they're not moving quickly enough. And so I think part of the barrier is breaking down the lack of understanding about how we actually have complementary roles to work together, right? That we need to understand what that parliamentary world is about and what the limitations of that are, but also political parties need to understand that engaging in broader social politics is actually a good and powerful thing and can move their agenda forward. And in fact, it should be the same agenda. But sometimes it gets very confused and people get really turned off and then they get pissed off and then there's a lack of trust and so it sort of spirals downwards. So it's, uh, it's something that I'm, I'm writing about and trying to explore myself because I sure don't have all the answers, but I'm glad you raised it because I think it's one of the keys you know, if there, were, if, if there was an issue that I had to identify, you know, I talked about income inequality and, and um, res I think the other big one is resource management and climate change, not only in BC but across Canada, like dealing with that question. Um, and then the third one is actually how we work with people, right? I don't want this kind of old style politics, right, of these barriers and silos. This should be about people engaging together and having a more participatory democracy and that so that means political parties have to change and it means that in the community we have to be willing to engage with that political process as well. Great. We're going to take uh, three final questions but Libby will be hanging out here for another half hour so you'll be able to come and uh, talk to her uh, directly so I can't see what the next question is. There's a microphone coming to you shortly here. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I was wondering if you've been following the U.S. presidential election at all, and <laughs> what your thoughts? No, are. that one was coming. No. Um, and I just have one more question. I'm wondering, through all of your years of experience in public service, what do you think it means to be Canadian? Sorry, what it means to be Canadian? Ah. Okay, we got next. Uh, 
Is there another question back? Uh, yes, um, I have a question. But before I, have, uh, I ask my question, I want to thank, uh, publicly thank um, uh, Mr. Davis for her action, for her brief, brief action, standing up to Americans, following in the way of, um, of, the, of, the, of the second Iraqi war when she and a few other parliamentarians went to the States and said, we would like to in, in, uh, inspect your ma uh, weapons of ma mass, mass uh, uh, destruction uh, uh, inventory as well. I think that was a very, very, very uh, brave, brave principle of action. So I want to thank her for that. Uh, the question I want to ask is that um, most recently, uh, the NDP said they're going to, to uh, to regenerate itself. And one of the, firm, one of the principal uh, action of the regenerating is to re, re, reconnect with the progressives. Uh, that in other words, is to, to, uh, to regain those uh, uh, people that lost to the liberal in the last uh, federal election. Okay, specifically, uh, uh, Mr. Davis, if you were also in the room of making those decisions and, uh, and, and planning, how would you uh, approach to specifically and substantively to in re-engaging the progressives? Great. Thank you. And we're going to take one final question. So is there one back there? Oh, there's one <coughs> second one here. Yeah, there's a microphone coming. Uh, would you say something about the responsibility of the press and the media to get uh, the story of the downtown east side suffering out? Like, I, 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 I tend to, why do they back away and let's say, that why doesn't a reporter come down and live in an SRO and then tell us what it's like so the wider community knows, so there's more empathy to, uh, from the wider community towards what happens in the downtown east side? Thanks. Okay, wow, you guys have had just great questions. Um, U.S. election, well, I have to say, you know, part of me is in awe of just what a spectacular show it is. I, uh, my partner and I, Kim, we watched the Democratic Convention. Did anybody else here watch it? It was like blew me away. Like they, you know, they had these awesome speakers, and it's ten thousand people, and and it's so well organized. And I was like, wow, it's like this is a big show. I also watched part of the Republican convention. God help me, and it was it looked like you know a tomb. You know, the, there was just no uh, vitality. But you know, I felt like I had to listen to what this guy was saying. And it was horrible. Um, so the U.S. election, I mean, it's, uh, it's so polarized, right? And I think to get to your other question, I, I mean, I, don't, I think in Canada we're, we're not so polarized, right? The, the political discourse here is broader, and I'm always thankful for that. I, I actually wonder whether I ever could have gotten elected in the States. Some of the issues I've taken on, whether you know, it was the Middle East and Palestine or, or, or the drug issue, and I always think, you know, would, would I have ever been able to be elected? A, I wouldn't have been able to raise enough money, so I'm very glad we have, like, much uh, stronger rules here about running and money that, you know, a ceiling. Um, and, and I think, so that's part of being Canadian. I think we have a much stronger public discourse. In the U.S., it's become so narrow like it, it, it blows me away that after every public speech, they have to say, God bless America. You know, and I, was, I always think, why, why do they have to say that? It's just so much of their culture. We, we wouldn't really do that here. I've never said that. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we have a bigger space here, although for a while it got, I mean, it, it narrows here too. I mean, I can tell you a lot about, um, you know, Parliament Hill and just debate around the Middle East, and it, it felt like censorship, right? It felt like a new form of McCarthyism that was settling like a cloud on Parliament Hill where MPs were afraid to speak out on issues around the Middle East for fear of being branded an anti-Semitic uh, anti or, or anti-Israel or worse, pro-terrorist, right? Uh, so that it happened here too, but not to the extent that it's happened there in terms of, you know, whether it's, I mean, another big distinguishing factor, I think, is, is just the whole um, culture of guns. And, and we have had a little bit of that here, but nothing 
as pervasive as what it is in the United States? Uh, that's a very minimal answer. I'm sure you've got a lot of really great thoughts as well. Um, I can't read my own writing. Uh, I'll have to skip over that one then. I don't know what the heck it says. Uh, media. The role of the media. Um, you know what? The media in Vancouver used to cover the downtown east side really well. There were columnists who used to follow what was going on with great interest. There were, there were reporters at the cop shop filing stories every day. Uh, there were people who were very interested. But what's happened? Well, Canada has some of the highest concentration of corporate media ownership anywhere in the world. So what we read in the Vancouver Sun is the same as they're reading in the Ottawa Citizen, is the same they're reading in the Montreal Gazette, because it's all now tightly controlled, and you see how small the paper is, right? And I mean, it's not just the, the written word, it's, it's, it's the, uh, the uh, digital media as well. Um, so, so the whole control of the media has shrunk, that that local coverage has really just almost disappeared. So I think that's part of the problem. Now, what it means is that we have to work harder, we have to be more creative in how we get the coverage. One of the reasons we were so successful in the 1970s is because we got fantastic media coverage. You know, when Van der Zam had his big campaign of like, those bums on welfare, you know, they're, 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 they don't, you know, they don't want to work, give them a shovel. Who remembers the Van der Zam, give them a shovel, okay? You know what we did? We took our shovels, we went out to his garden store in Burnaby and we demanded to be hired. Well, of course, there were no jobs and we took all the media with us and it was on BCTV that night and Van der Zam looked like an idiot because, of course, you know, his own company wasn't hiring. And so we made a point. Not only was he poor bashing, but unemployment was actually very high and people actually couldn't get jobs. We, we used the media to do it. It would be very hard to do that now. It's much harder to get media attention. And when you do get media attention, of course, if there's anything that's remotely uh, deemed to be violent, then of course that's what they'll focus on and, and your whole rally or your whole mass demonstration gets completely you know, turned sideways because of some minor thing on the side. So it means we have to be a, a lot more creative about how we, how we interrelate with the media and use, use um, alternative media. You know, uh, My partner is the publisher at rabble.ca. They do great coverage of, of activism and local events. Um, you know, we, have, we have all kinds of um, local media here, even in the downtown east side. I mean, Jackie, you're your journalism classes. Well, we, we become our own reporters, right? We get our own story out, and maybe that's what we need to focus on. Don't rely on the others to do it. We get our own story out, and we, we, we connect with people that way. I just want to say, I think it's quite clear that Libby hasn't yet entered her dotage period. There's still a lot of political fire in the, in the belly. I wanted to thank you all for being here. Thank you to Jackie Wong. And thank you so much to Libby Davies.